They're really cute. Our little, our baby, our little, we call her little, she's uh, 70 pounds. I did, I did like the mediums, like medium size. We have called little mediums and big ends.
We can't go back and look at them, can we? Like we have one That's, minute. I was coming to that. Yeah, you have. You cannot go. When the exam is over, when you've circled all the way around the room, um, then I'll collect your papers and you're done. You can't go back and look at something else. Um, and write something down for every answer uh, because you may get half credit for it. You don't need to put right or left. You don't need to put nerve artery in vein. Uh, so, okay? Any other questions about the practical? It goes pretty quickly. All right. So we're today, today we're going to talk about the face, uh, and we're going to end this test block tomorrow with the uh, orbital contents and the, um, the ear and eye. And um, some of the things that I'm going to talk about uh, will just be confined to the written exam. I mean, everything I talk about in here is just going to be confined to the written exam. We're not going to dissect the ear and probably not the orbit tomorrow. Uh, so that won't be, they won't be tagged structures. The, in, the inside of the cranium will be, but not the ear or eye. Another thing is, the, and the last thing I'm going to talk about today is a deep dissection through here. It's like on the other side of the mandible. I'm going to show you pictures of it, but we're not going to dissect it uh, in the lab. Okay? So, here we go with the face. Uh, before we get to the face, though, we need to talk about osteoporosis. Uh, it's probably an on-off issue. Yep. Nope. Okay. That was quick. Uh, let's talk about some osteology here. Uh, and there are skulls in, the, in those plastic bins that are responsible for all those pieces of parts on those skulls. Um, on the lateral view of the skull here, you see uh, certain structures. Uh, let's go over, go over these. Um, there are two parts to the skull. One of them is, is the, the facial part here. This is called the visceral versus the part that houses the brain which is called the neurocranium. If we look at the visceral cranium, we have the, the mandible here uh, with its condylar and coronary processes. We'll talk about those later on. And the notch between the two. The uh, condylar process uh, articulates with a, a, a notch in the zygomatic bone here. I mean, excuse me, the zygomatic process of the temporal bone. The zygomatic bone is up here. So this process is an elongation of the temporal bone. This flat part of the temporal bone here is called the squamous portion of the temporal bone. Squamous meaning flat. There's the mastoid process that we saw yesterday of the temporal bone. The external auditory meatus is the opening in the bony ear canal. In front of that, in just a little bit medial, is a little horn-like structure. It's called the styloid process. It's not labeled on this uh, skull, but it's a, it's a uh, protrusion. It's a, it looks like a horn. It sticks down called the styloid process. There are a few small muscles that attach to it. But you can see it right there. The other bones uh, that we deal with in the visceral cranium will be the, the large maxillary bone here that houses your maxillary sinus. The frontal bone actually makes up part of it because it makes up part of the orbit here superior part of the orbit. And between the two orbits you have the nasal bone here, two nasal bones. We'll go over in more detail of the mandible later on in the, in the show. On the neurocranium here, uh, in addition to the temporal bone, you have in the back the occipital bone, above that or in front of that is the parietal bone, and then over here is the frontal bone. 
as you can see here, you have two parietal bones, one frontal and occipital bone. They form uh, a series of suture lines, and that's what's called when these bony plates grow together. You have um, in the midline here, you have what's called a sagittal suture, right there in the midline. And then you have two cor uh, coronal type sutures. Uh, one of them is actually called the coronal suture. The other is called the lambdoid or lambdoidal suture. That's in the back. Where the lambdoid suture meets the sagittal suture, you call that little point right there, lambda. In the front, that point is called bregma. And when you're born, the, the flat bones of the skull have yet to fuse, and that's the soft spot on the baby's uh, head, is bregma. It closes at about a year of age. It's a very useful tool, though, uh, before it closes, because in kids who are dehydrated, um, bregma is sunken in. In kids with increased pressure inside the skull because of meningitis, encephalitis, or uh, intracranial trauma, it's bulgy. So when you do a physical exam on, a new, on a, a, an infant, uh, you make sure that you uh, note you know, whether fontanelle is the late term for it. The fontanelle is flat, bulgy, or depressed. So if you have a kid with a high fever, um, not active, you certainly don't want to miss meningitis. And so this is one of those things that you would, would document. Well, also from the face, uh, from, excuse me, from the frontal view here, you have uh, several foramina or holes that are apparent in the skull. <coughs> you have uh, one above the orbit that's called the supraorbital foramen. Supraorbital foramen. And then you have an infraorbital foramen. And then you have a mental foramen down here in the mandible. Medially to the supraorbital foramen, there's a notch. It's not labeled on here, but it's called the supraorbital notch. It's medial to the foramen. So here is the supraorbital foramen. There's the notch. It's closer to, to the nose. Some people can feel, if your face is thin, if you feel right around in here, you can feel a little depressed area. That's your mental foramen. You can feel your mental foramen. Some people can. You have 32 teeth normally. Uh, we'll deal with those when we get to the oral cavity. Any questions about this? On the next slide, um, we have another bone that I want to talk about here for a second. We talked about the temporal bone, the parietal, frontal, occipital. There's another bone that you see right here. It's called the sphenoid bone. It's right there. The sphenoid bone actually forms the core of the skull, and then things are built around it. So the sphenoid bone runs from one side of the skull all the way over to the other. So from the lateral area, you can see it here. And by the way, before I, uh, in case I forget to tell you tomorrow, the thinnest part of this neurocranium right here is the squamous portion of the temporal bone. If you have a fracture of the skull, uh, you get hit right there, that's where it's most likely going to occur, right here. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look specifically at the sphenoid bone. We've pulled it out of the center of the skull. If you, it's hard to see it over here, but that's the sphenoid bone right here in the center, and it extends out on both sides. And that's what it looks like right there. Here's the flat part we were looking at in the previous slide right here. There are, a couple of prominent, there are several prominent features of the sphenoid bone. One of them is it, it has two <coughs> wings, like a bird's wing. It's got lesser wing of the sphenoid, 
which is on the top, and a greater wing of the sphenoid, which is this flat part down here on the bottom. So you have a greater wing of the sphenoid, less wing of the sphenoid. <coughs> These two wings, they don't come together. There's actually a gap between the two of them. That gap is called the superior orbital fissure. Superior orbital fissure is the gap between the lesser and greater wing of the sphenoid. You see it? Right here in the middle, um, there's a structure called the cella tercica. And I'm sure you remember from undergraduate days, that's uh, Latin or something for Turkish saddle. You know, it looks like one of those weird things the hippies used to have back in the 60s as they were hitting the bombs. Um, anyway, uh, there's a depression there that is, uh, is called the hypophyseal fossa. H Y P O P H facile fossa. <laughs> hypophyseal fossa. The pituitary gland is called the hypophysis. And it's the depressed area, it's the fossa where, where the pituitary gland will sit. Now it's surrounded on four sides, or the four corners of this area, by clinoid processes. You have anterior clinoid processes and posterior clinoid processes. You can see these on a real skull much easier. Those clinoid processes are for attachment of dura that I'll explain tomorrow. Now sticking, you okay? Sticking down from the, uh, the cella tercica are these perpendicular plates that go straight up and down like this in your skull, right up and down. These are called the medial and lateral pterygoid plates. Medial and lateral pterygoid plates. The medial plate has a hook on it, or hamulus, called the pterygoid hamulus or the uh, hook of the medial plate. And what that hook does is there's a muscle that resides within this little fossa here. The tendon comes down and hooks around that uh, little hamulus there. So this, remember, this thing is sitting in the center of my skull, right? Center of my skull. So the, hamu the plates are right here in the back of my oral cavity. The muscle that comes down and around that hook actually attaches to my uvula. So when that muscle contracts, it pulls that way up around the hook and actually flattens my uvula. That's why it's the, the purpose of it. There are also some foramen within the sphenoid bone itself. Uh, they're noted here. We know about the superior orbital fissure. Right here behind the anterior clinoid processes, you have the optic foramen. A little bit more inferior, you have foramen rotundum. Then more posterior, you have foramen oval. And then right behind foramen oval, there's foramen spinosum. You're going to see all of these tomorrow <coughs> in the or you can see them this afternoon. Uh, but I'm going to talk about these foramina specifically tomorrow and what goes through them. Okay? But you can get a jump on that if you grab the skull of the day and start going through these pieces and parts. Okay. Some, of the, some of the skulls over there are real human skulls. So they break easily, so be careful with them. Others are plastic. So the foramina don't really go all the way through. Uh, and you figure out quickly which one's which. Any questions about the sphenoid bone? Yes, ma'am. Is the... Um, Jenna? Yes. Is that the other one? Yep. Okay. Is the um, skull stuff, we're not doing anything actually with the cadaver. Uh, tomorrow, you're going to cut the... Um, 
the skull cap off and we're going to remove the brain. Um, if you want, we don't have to do all six of them, but we need to do at least maybe two or three. But if you want to remove a brain, uh, you can do that um, on your cadaver. If you want to do all six of you want to do it, that's fine. But you will be tested, and I'll tell you tomorrow what you'll be tested over regarding these structures. So talk about the scalp for a second. Um, we're eventually going to make our way down to the face, so hang on here. Um, the scalp is uh, unique in its structure in terms of skin uh, because of the following reasons. First of all, over here in this illustration, the skin is the first thing you're going to run into, obviously. That's the epidermis and the dermis right there. Underneath that is an area of connective tissue. Uh, it's called here the sub, uh, subcutaneous tissue right there. That would be the, the, the true superficial fascia or the subcutaneous tissue that we know about. But then right under that is an area, is, is a uh, structure called the aponeurosis. Aponeurosis means a, um, it's an um, intertwined fibrous sheath that's very, very tough. This aponeurosis is continuous in the front with the frontalis muscle, goes up and over your head, and is continuous in the back with the occipitalis muscle. So when you're doing like this, when you raise your eyebrows, that's the frontalis muscle. It's attached to the, to the occipitalis back here. So when you've been studying all day with your head down and your eyes are like this, you know, as you're studying, and you get this uh, tight tiredness in the back of your neck here, and you've got this raging frontal headache like that, well, the reason you have a frontal headache is because this occipitalis is pulling down and it's pulling against your aponeurosis and which is pulling your head up after eight hours of studying, and now you have a freaking headache. Okay. Mm. So it's continuous. And it's tight. It's tight. Underneath that aponeurosis is another connective, connective tissue layer. It's called the loose areolar layer. Like areola of the nipple, areola, but it's called areolar layer. Loose or real or layer. And then underneath that is the periosteum of the bone, the outermost covering of the bone. And if you go back and re rename these things, it's S C A L P. Okay? So that's not hard. Now, the thing about this uh, structure is that um, when you deal with uh, lax, L-A-C-S, a lax, short for laceration, on the scalp, one thing you're going to see later on is that the scalp is highly vascularized. You know that because you get out in the cold and you lose all the heat and stuff like that. Um, or you wear a hat and you stay warmer. Um, but uh, because of that, and because of the aponeurosis, the tight band between the occipitalis and the frontalis, if you have a coronal laceration, one in this direction, and you're looking at the wound and it's gaping, like this one right here is, you know you're through the aponeurosis. If it doesn't gape, like this one right here, then you're not through the aponeurosis. The other thing is if the laceration is in a sagittal plane, it won't gape regardless of how deep it is. Because that's the direction of the fibers of the aponeurosis. And finally, because of the loose areolar layer here, that, that is really loose. So you'll see in your cadaver, once you remove, cut through here, you can just take the skin and just easily pull it off, you know, scalp the, pull it off this, the bone. You're separating it along that loose areolar layer. 
because that's what gives you all the mobility motion of your scalp is that loose or real or layer. So I don't I don't know how many times I've seen it where somebody would have a low overhanging shelf or something and hit it and it just peels their skin, you know, it scalps them. Well that scalping is going to be uh, occur in that loose or real or plane. I had a lady one time come into the emergency room. This was like one o'clock in the morning, and she had a laceration right here. It was a pretty big laceration across the front. And the story was she fell off of her front porch and landed on a rock or something. She landed on something that cut her right here, right? So I'm sitting there looking at it, and I want to clean out this wound. So anytime I have a flap, you always lift up that flap to clean out from underneath it. I was able to, she had actually scalped herself. I was able to pull her whole scalp up. I was looking at the back of her skull, like, you know, and she, she was lying there like she, she had no idea that her, the laceration was that massive. Oh. It, it, it took a while to close that baby up. Mm. And what you want to do with something like that, you want to put a drain in it, because that's going to be draining fluid for a period of time. You certainly want to put them on antibiotics. It heals up just fine though. Alright, muscles of facial expression. All of these, and I mentioned this on the first day, are connected to the skin. So they're very superficial, like that platysma yesterday. So I'll go through here carefully. In your dissector, it tells you how to remove the, the skin of the face. You're going to go around the, the orbit, you're going to go around the lips here. Um, you can leave the nose most, mostly intact. You don't need to take the skin off the nose, really. But you want to remove the skin of the face today. So uh, this is one of those days where if you get a little squeamish, make sure you sit down. Uh, but you're going to be looking for some of these muscles. Now, the, there are a whole bunch of muscles in the facial expression, obviously. Uh, and I don't expect you to, to be able to recognize all of these. There are a couple, though, that you should be able to find really easy. One is the orbicularis oris. It, it acts as a purse string around your uh, mouth, your pucker uh, muscle. The other one up here is the orbicularis oculi. That, when it constricts, it will shut the, it will close the eye. The frontalis muscle here is the one that raises your eyelids. The risorius muscle here, you don't need to find this, but this is the muscle that does this. You do that, yeah, like that. Like, what the hell are you talking about? That's <laughs> the risorius. The corrugator up here is the one when you like, huh, what do you think? That one right there is the corrugator. Um, the buccinator out here is a deep muscle. Uh, when you, when you get to right here, there's a fat pad right here that's pretty impressive, about the size of a ping pong ball. You want to remove that. Uh, but the buccinator is down here. That's the one that, that when I say pump out your cheeks, that's buccinator. You have uh, several muscles here that go to the lips, the upper and lower lips. Those are the levator and depressor labii. And levator and depressor anguli, depending on whether it's in the middle of the lip or the, at the angle. And then you have two other muscles called zygomaticus major and minor. Don't worry about finding any of those muscles. You'll see them though, you'll see them attached to the lip as you remove the skin. But don't worry about identifying them. They're not really relevant. So what if it's a levator labii or the levator anguli? Right? Uh, the, other, the other one that I wouldn't spend time for, looking for is the mentalis. You know, some people, when they, they do like that, there, there's, yeah, that right there, where it's, yeah, just, where you get those little uh, dimples right here, yeah, like that right there. You can see she's contracting her. Yeah, yeah, you've got them up there. Yeah. Freaky. Freaky. Um, so, those are, those are some of the, the muscles. There's, there's some weird little muscles you don't need to, to worry about, but 
the, the point is here, they're all uh, re responsible for facial expression, which means they're all innervated by facial nerve. C uh, cranial nerve 7, not C7, that would be spinal nerve 7, cranial nerve or CN7, okay? Um, so here's something uh, you can, the next time you hear some happy anus say, you know, it takes more muscles to frown than it does to smile. You can call bullshit on that. <laughs> it does. It actually takes more muscles to smile than it does to smile. So... <laughs> <laughs> Tell them to go somewhere else to eat their damn yogurt. <laughs> <laughs> so we move, we move a little, <coughs> we move a little deeper. And here you can see the orbicularis ocular right there. Uh, we move a little deeper though. You're going to run into uh, today the muscles of mastication, at least a couple of them. And these are the two that are on the surface and are easy to see: uh, the temporalis muscle and the uh, mastic muscle. These both, these muscles both act to close the jaw. And I'll talk about those more a little bit later. They're innervated, even though they're here on the surface of the face, they're innervated by uh, what cranial nerve? By uh, Yeah, the trigeminal. Trigeminal nerve supplies the muscles of mastication. So if I'm doing a physical exam, <coughs> oh, oh, we're going to pick on Sydney. So if I'm doing um, <laughs> the physical exam, and we're sitting here, and I'm checking cranial nerves uh, five and seven. I'll start out with seven, say so raise your eyebrows. Uh -huh. Pop out your cheek, smile, round, okay? Well that's seven, right? Close your eyes, okay, that's seven. Close your eyes, Mike. Don't let me open them up. Good, okay, so she's got a good strength in that seven muscle. All right, now I want you to bite down real hard. And I'm feeling her masseter contract, okay? Relax, bite down again, and I'm feeling her temporalis contract up here, making sure it's the same on both sides. So that's how you test five and seven. There are other muscles of mastication I'll show you in a later slide. This is our platysma we saw yesterday. It's innervated by cranial nerve seven. Yes. All right, the nose. The nose has you know, two nasal bones up here. You can feel the nasal bone. And then there's a step off right here in your nasal bone. You can feel it. There's a step off, and that's where your cartilage starts. The cartilage, the nasal cartilage, has really three parts. The alar part is out here in your nostrils, and the septum is inside of there. You can feel the septum. And then up here is the lateral portions up here that attach to your nasal bone. Those are the three cartilages of the, the, na the um, nasal structures. When you see somebody that looks like that, uh, that is not a fracture of the cartilage, that's a fracture of the bone. And in an x-ray here, you can see that the bone is fractured pretty clearly right there. Uh, most of the time, you don't do anything with that. People always come to the ER right after a, a you know, they get their nose broken. Um, you know, you want to do a neuro exam, make sure everything's intact, uh, but you actually don't fix it most of the time in the emergency room. Wait a day or two, let the swelling go down, and then uh, uh, reduce it. Uh, you don't really do that much in the, in the ER. You put a little band, uh, a, a, a splint on the nose to protect it, but you want the swelling to go down before you attempt to straighten that baby up. Do you cast noses after the swelling stone? Is that what you mean by reduce? No, no. Uh, reduce means to align the oh. broken bones, to reduce them. You would just simply just, all you got to do is put your hands, your fingers on them like that, get a good grasp. And what you can, one thing you can do is, it, this is obviously going to be painful. And you can anesthetize them any number of ways. There is actually liquid cocaine that you have them snort. You work in an emergency room <laughs> to, to, to numb, to numb the, uh, the nasal mucosa. The other thing you can do is, you know, there's a, 
there's a thing called a nebulizer that the asthmatics use, a little machine with a little yeah. thing you, you breathe into. What you can do is load that up with, um, okay. like we were talking about. No, 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 load it up with lidocaine. Lidocaine. And have them put a mask on and have them breathe through their nose, and that will numb their nose up. Uh, anyway, you take the take the, your fingers here and you just uh, manipulate it to line it back up. That's all you got to do. Is it kind of just like a, you go off a feel? There's no like I don't know. It seems like a very unprecise art. It is. It is. You just kind of and that's why you want the swelling to go down. Mm -hmm. So you kind of line it back up and look at it. Eh, does that look right? You know, if not, kind of tweak it a little bit. <laughs> But that's what you don't you don't put anything on it other than a, a little splint just to protect it. You don't cast it uh, like you would a regular one. And if it grows and it's crooked and it grows and, and heals that way, you can always send them to an ENT and they can rebrand it and straighten it out in the uh, OR. So this O is an easy fix to it. Uh, now, we talked about the muscles of mastication being fine. The other component of the cranial nerve is sensation to the face. And there, uh, that's done by the trigeminal nerve. Now, you see the trigeminal nerve coming out of the palms right here. So there's the cut end of it there, and there's, so that's where it's cut right there. It goes a short way, and then there's this large, flat structure here. It's the size of a quarter sits on either side of the cella turcica inside the, inside the cranial ball. That's called the trigeminal ganglia. Some people call it the semilunar ganglion. Some people call it the gasserian ganglion. I like to just call it the trigeminal ganglion. And then coming off the front of that are three large branches. The ophthalmic branch, the maxillary branch, and the mandibular branch. The ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. Just think of it this way. What are the three regions of the visceral cranium? The eyes, the, <coughs> the maxillary, and the mandibular. <coughs> what are the three holes that we've talked about? Supraorbital, infraorbital, mental. That's where they end up. Now, the distribution is here. The uh, ophthalmic gets the front of the scalp and the forehead down to the tip of the nose. The maxillary gets the uh, kind of the stripe in the middle here, and your whole maxillary, your upper teeth, and your lower teeth, as well as the mandible in front of the ear, is done by the uh, mandibular branch. These things are often designated V1, V2, and V3. What is the sensory innervation of the actual eye itself? Like it's five. Five. Yeah, we'll get into that one. It's five. The corneal, the sensation of the cornea is five. The sensation inside the mouth is five. So five gets everything. Inside your nose is five. It's all five. It just happens to be where it is. Cornea is ophthalmic. Uh, oral cavity is mandible. Um, so, since it's a sensory nerve, what is the morphology of the nerve? Pseudo unipolar. So where is the where is the cell body? Trigeminal ganglia. Trigeminal ganglia. So when I said on the first day when we were talking about the organization of the nervous system, I said from the mandible down, all somatic, afferent, and visceral afferent cell bodies are located in what structure? The dorsal root ganglion. Well, from the mandible up, they're all located in the trigeminal ganglion. Are there any synapses in the trigeminal ganglion? No. It's a sensory ganglion. Are there any synapses in the dorsal root ganglion? No. It's a sensory ganglion. Are there synapses in the sympathetic chain ganglia? Yes. yes. Are there synapses in the pre-aortic ganglia? Yes. Are there synapses in the cardiac ganglia? Yes. yes. Okay, good. You guys are getting that. All right. So you see all these branches of the trigeminal nerve? 
You're going to find all of them, just to let you know. Um, okay? Uh, herpes zoster is a reactivation of the varicella virus. So if you had chicken pox as a kid, uh, later on in your life, at some point in your life, you will, wound up, you will wind up uh, reactivating that viral DNA in your um, neurons, and it will manifest on the skin as painful, uh, open, uh, ulcerative type lesions. A cold sore uh, here is a herpes uh, type thing. Uh, zoster is varicella. They're all of the herpes family. Genital herpes is the same thing. Okay. Um, if that virus reactivates, and what the virus does is it reactivates and in, is expelled from the neuron out to peripheral terminals. The sensory, the, the intake, you know, the, the dendrites of the sensory nerves travels down and, and pops out on the skin. And so that's what you see here are all these, is a reactivation of herpes virus or herpes zoster along this gentleman's right ophthalmic division of his trigeminal nerve. And it doesn't really cross the midline. And you can get zoster in any dermatome, any sensory nerve distribution, but it'll be in a, it'll be in a well-defined streak. We see this all the time in clinic. The problem is, if it's herpes zoster ophthalmicus, because of what I just told you, the eye is supplied by the ophthalmic division, you can wind up with herpes of the cornea. And it produces a, a ulcerations called dendritic ulcerations, and you can lose your eyesight uh, because of it. Anytime you have a patient presenting with this or that, anytime a patient comes in saying, I've got this tingling sensation in here. I woke up with this morning, it's a tingling sensation. You start them on antivirals and get them to an ophthalmologist that day because they need to be followed by an ophthalmologist because of the eye issue. And the important point here is if a person comes in, and the older you are, the more likely you are to have zoster. If a 70-year-old guy comes in and says, I woke up this morning and my nose is tingling. I don't know what's going on with my nose. That's an immediate trip to the ophthalmologist because zoster in the ophthalmic branch of the trigeminal nerve, I said, gets the tip of the nose. Don't wait for the blisters to surface. Get up, get up that appointment. How common is it for it to happen in that region where it gets into the eye? Oh, it's quite common. I'd probably see, when I was working in family medicine, you don't see it here working in a student clinic or over at Good Shepherd, but when I was working in family medicine, you'd probably see at least a, one case a month with this. And it doesn't get this bad because it's horrendously painful. You know, it'll be like one or two little bumps, and you have to, you have to immediately say, oh, this is not a pimple. This is, you have to treat it as herpes zoster ophthalmicus and get them into an ophthalmologist. So does it show up in labs? Like, if you were to pull labs, would it be like, yeah, like, narrow it down to this? If you showed up in or is it, like, if you were to collect labs, would labs come back positive for a certain Oh, yeah, I mean, if you, were to, if you were to uh, do a skin scraping here and send it off for a lab, you'll, you'll get back to this herpes. Okay. But that takes too long. Yeah. You don't, you don't even wait for it. The story, okay, so the, everything, everybody would do after me. Tingling? Tingling. Ophthalmologist. Ophthalmologist. <laughs> Antivirus. Don't wait for blisters. <laughs> Don't wait for blisters. Okay. All right. All right. So here we we talked about the three holes. Here we see the termination of the ophthalmic division coming out the supra 
orbital foramen, that's going to be the superorbital nerve. That notch that's medial is called the supratrochlear nerve right there. Superorbital, supratrochlear. There's the infraorbital, and there's the mental nerve down here coming out the mental foramen of the mandible. I'm sorry? It looks like worms going into his nose. They're not. They're <laughs> nerves. Okay. So the tip of the nose is the top. The tip of the nose is V1. The side of the nose is V2. All right, now, here's the thing. If I have a laceration of this lip here, if I a bar fight, and somebody got their lip busted right here, big old wide laceration of the lip, you see it all the time in emergency room. Now, there are two ways to do it. You can take your lidocaine and inject into the wound to try to anesthetize it, and that hurts, obviously. Um, and when you start injecting lidocaine, it puffs up the tissue, so it's kind of hard to get everything approximated. The other thing you can do is just take your needle and syringe and go right up through here, right towards the middle of the eyeball. You're aiming for that target right there. Just get it in that area. You don't have to find it specifically, just get it in the area, dump your lidocaine and squirt your, inject your lidocaine, and what you're going to do is you're going to do a block, an infraorbital nerve block, and that will make the whole side of their face numb, and you can sew it up without any um, Swell. distortion hmm. due to you know, pumping the lip full of lidocaine. Very easy to do these blocks. Here's the uh, top of the scalp here showing the profuse blood supply. A couple of arteries we need to talk about. One is a superficial temporal artery. So we have the internal carotid that goes inside the cranial ball. The external carotid supplies the viscerocranium. The external carotid ends in two arteries. One is the superficial temporal and one is the maxillary that supplies the deep face. I'll show it to you later on. So those are the two terminal branches of the, the external carotid, the superficial temporal and the maxillary. If you put your fingers right here, you can feel the pulse of your superficial temporal artery. It's pretty easy to do right there. It's a big artery. When you get a laceration right there, oh my gosh, those things bleed like crazy. There's another branch off of, a couple of other branches off of the external carotid would be the occipital and the posterior auricular. So the external carotid really supplies the, you know, the back two-thirds of the scalp. These two arteries right here, are supraorbital and supratrochlear, come out of the same holes as the nerves. The supraorbital and supratrochlear come out through here and go up. So they're coming from inside the skull, meaning that those arose from the internal carotid. These things bleed so well, I mean, and so much. The scalp has such a profuse blood supply. If you lacerate anywhere else on your body, you need to have it sutured be before eight hours. That's kind of the cutoff. Um, otherwise, it won't close back together. The scalp, though, because it has such a great blood supply, you can wait 12, 16 hours and then sew it up and it'll heal just fine. I had this guy come in one time. Funniest thing, I, he, he, was a he was schizophrenic. And I mean, he was just like loopy. And he, he did something, he cut it, he hit, he hit his head, had a little laceration. So I stopped the bleeding. I you know, clamped it or did some whatever. I stopped the bleeding. I get the guy all sutured up, put about 20 sutures in him, all sutured up, and all of a sudden, he had got his tennis ball size not on his head because the bleeder had started again and was bleeding into the loose areolar layer. That's why you have such huge uh, goose eggs 
on your right, right. I said, crap. I didn't know if his whole head would blow up. <laughs> but I took all down, all 20 sutures out, found that bleeder, tied off the bleeder, and sewed him up again. Crap. So, you know, I've spent now two hours on this guy, sent him home. He comes back in the next day, he's got that goose egg back again. I did it again. I, so I, I finally got it stopped. But the point of the story is, these things, the arterial supply is huge. And these things, uh, they bleed like crazy. Uh, a lot of times when you inject lidocaine, if you don't want them to bleed so much, you put epinephrine. Uh, there's some lidocaine that comes with epinephrine in it, and that will constrict the blood vessels so you have a clear field to sew, up, sew them up. The other thing that happens is because that loose or real or layer continues onto the face, essentially, as the subcutaneous tissue, when you have a goose egg up here, what happens to that blood? You will always have, a few days later, a black eye. It's just the gravity taking the blood down. Okay? The vascular supply of the face, and now here we have a superficial temporal artery right here. We see that right in front of the ear, deep to the parotid gland. Here's another one that comes up, up over the, uh, the mandible here. Some of you found it yesterday when we removed the skin of the face, or skin down here. That's the facial artery. It comes off of the external parotid and comes up over the angle of uh, the mandible here, the inferior part of the mandible, and it takes a course right up through here to end in the angle of the eye. That's why it's, it ends as the angular artery. That's the facial artery with its corresponding superficial and facial veins, superficial temporal and facial veins. If you put your fingers right here, if you have a thin face, you can usually feel the uh, pulse of the facial artery. Another artery that supplies the face is this one right here called the transverse facial. It's a small artery that runs superficial to the masseter and is just above the parotid duct. You can't miss it. Now one thing I want you to, to understand is let me get these thin faced people So bite down, right there. There's our masseter right there. Look how thin that tissue is overlying it. You've got the transverse facial artery, the parotid duct right there. It is really superficial. So lacerations in this area here, you want to make sure those important structures aren't cut, especially that parotid duct. And on the next slide, you can see a little better the um, facial artery as it comes up over and goes up to the angle of the eye. It gives off three branches as it travels up, at least three branches. One is the inferior labial, supplies the lower lip. One is the superior labial, and then the other one is the lateral nasal that supplies the, the, the lateral side of the nose. The inside of the nose is the blood supply comes from the inside, I'll show you later on. But the outside of the nose is the lateral nasal. Now, these uh, labial arteries, the superior and inferior labial arteries, if you take and cut the lip like this, and just look at the two cut ends, you can see the little arteries, the cut arteries. Now, if you know about physics, when a tube diameter is decreased by half, the pressure inside the diameter is increased by uh, to the fourth power. So if you look at the aorta, which is right here, that's 120 millimeters of mercury. You decrease the diameter in the common carotid, in the external carotid, in the facial, in the labial. The pressure inside of these little suckers right here is enormous. That's why when you get into bar fight and they split your lip, it bleeds everywhere. There's blood everywhere. The other thing about this, and then we'll take a break here, is that the venous drainage through the facial vein 
communicates, you can't see it real well here, it communicates uh, with veins that drain <coughs> into the cranial vault. The facial veins, these uh, cutaneous veins, communicate through the orbit to veins that are inside the cranial vault. That's why they tell you not to pick at zits in this area of the face because infection can travel through those communicating veins to enter the inside of your cranium. That's not where you want infection to be. And I'll show you a couple of examples here. Don't pick any zits right there in the danger triangle. Back in the 1900, you know, a long time ago, where was, this is an old picture, obviously, <coughs> telling the little adolescent people not to be picking at zits there, because the, the facial vein communicates through these veins to get inside <coughs> the vault. That thing right there is called a cavernous sinus. <coughs> I'm going to talk about it tomorrow. You don't want infection in there. This guy right here, he did it. He's got, he's got um, infection in his skin. That redness, that red, bright red, fiery red uh, appearance. If you look over here, it's really tight and shiny because of lymphatic, uh, in, you know, the amount of pus that's within his dermis and subcute area. It's putting pressure on the skin. This is called erysipelas. E R Y S Zipolis. Erysipelas. This is usually due to an infection with uh, strep and staph, it's usually a combination of the two. It's, your skin is just covered with strep and staph. You can see when 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 this guy when this guy showed up in the in the emergency room, you see they outlined the the redness. The purpose for doing that, and you do this frequently, regardless uh, <coughs> where the erysipelas occurs, uh, because you're going to put this person on high dose antibiotics. You want to make sure that tomorrow the redness does not extend beyond your marks. If it does, you better do something else. You had a question? Uh, Jesus. And that was how to spell erysipelas? No, it wasn't. Okay. Any questions about that? Alright, so um, take a break and then we'll come back, okay? Erysipelas is very common. You see